Okay, welcome back. This is Peeling Sid Barrett and episode 26, King of Paint. And I'm giving it that title because I want to spend most of this episode just kind of discussing an aspect of Mr. Barrett's painting. And we'll look through portions, anyway, of some of his paints or some of his works of art and uh, discuss them, I guess, a bit. So uh, usually this is a time where we kind of discuss some corrections or thoughts from previous episodes, and I guess my biggest concern really is that the Did Sid More, More Meadows uh, episode that we released in the Did Sid series, it's a, over an hour long, but I mean we discuss an entire album and a movie, and I do feel like there are songs there like um, Cymbeline and Cirrus Minor that really you could spend a lot of time just kind of trying to break those down singularly and I just kind of put them all together in one episode and it's because they kind of fit together but I do feel that uh, perhaps that was a bit rushed and I could have spent more time on them but I mean you can only spend so much time on these things so I do kind of regret not being able to spend more time to specifically develop each song on, on, on its own. At any rate, uh, what I'd like to do is kind of call out um, some comments that folks have been making and, and discuss them a little bit. Now, we do have some new people that have joined, which is really cool. Um, if, feel free to make comments if you've joined. And um, I try to go through and answer or at least discuss things. And hopefully people will actually discuss with one another ideas as well. So um, one of the people that uh, commented is Sudarshana, who um, I've been in touch with quite frequently over topics. And there's a couple things that uh, Mr. Sudarshana has kind of pointed out. One is, who is possibly writing the lyrics to um, songs and in particular a soundtrack like more and uh, their opinion was that it's very likely Mr. Waters who is just trying to echo Mr. Barrett's uh, tendencies or style of writing and that's totally I, I think believable as I've said there are three possibilities in my mind one is that of course that they're continuing to work together one is that uh, they perhaps expected to work together in in some way but they had to release him right away because they knew that it wasn't working out and it's just an influence thing which is an indirect thing and uh, then a final which is that uh, perhaps they plan to work together indefinitely but only did for a short while and perhaps this is one of the albums that uh, was put together with some of Mr. Bird's influence uh, working as a writer in some fashion any of those three I think is definitely possible. You can make an argument for any of those three. And it does kind of boil down to, I think, a person's um, somewhat subjective opinion, really. And so uh, I try to go through and look at the, the lyrics to the songs and score them so that people can kind of make, it a, make, a, make their own choice. But obviously I have my own opinion and everyone has a bias in many ways so uh, in my bias uh, I will admit that um, a lot of these songs at least immediately after Mr. Barrett's uh, departure do in my opinion have quite a bit of his influence for some reason and what that is I don't know I am a little bit suspicious of things going on but uh, again it's it's not knowable so there's really no way of proving whether or not Mr. Barrett was uh, working with with any of the guys in the in the group in some fashion. So um, that was one thing. Another thing that Mr. Sudarshana kind of pointed out was that uh, there is a a uh, method of writing, I guess, that happened on the Indian subcontinent, and it's called uh, Deva Deva Nagari, I believe, is what it's called. And it also is a phonetic uh, type of writing that is very similar to uh, Japanese katakana, which is pretty cool. And uh, I read about it a little bit because he mentioned it. So I, I appreciate that, um, that 
it was brought to my attention and it, it also interestingly calls out exactly the same types of connections so the ka and the ga sound the k and the g because they form the same part of the throat the t and the d connection ta tha ta ta da da and uh uh, they do connect cha with ja, so a ch and a jh in, instead of a, in the uh, in Japanese katakana, it's, it's s h and j, so she and g are are connected, but very very similar. So interesting. Now I bring that up, of course, because uh, here's another correction: is that in the past I've been mentioning clanging, which is apparently a, a kind of a psychological term for people that connect words and is an indicator it is an indicator of in some cases of schizophrenia so at some point in time I have read that and I've been applying it to the word connections that mr. Barrett has been making or when I see it now the truth is that um, or the truth is that in my opinion anyway the truth is that it's very difficult to know when someone is simply making alliteration so uh, alliteration is simply using the same letter or sound in a poetic fashion and clanging is basically putting together word associations more on their sound than their meaning how do you know when someone is doing one or the other uh, I don't know I'm not a psychologist as, as I've said many times but I think you can see as we've gone through these that in most cases it has simply been a case of alliteration and for this point I'll I'll point to the song Astronomy Domine where where the lyrics kind of go uh, down around the sound resounds around the icy waters underground so down 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 is used at, in an alliterative sense it, it is not an incoherent statement based totally on sound it actually makes a bit of sense in a way uh, to express something that is uh, otherworldly, obviously, so it's difficult to understand in a way, but it also is a, using alliteration to kind of poetically describe something. Now, um, Mr. John Clare, who is someone that we have discussed a little bit, is someone that is, I think, interesting in the way that he uses um, alliteration and changes words and he was quite an odd fellow so uh, I'll just leave it at that and what I'll go ahead and suggest is that you read about Mr. John Clare and the way that he ended up uh, expressing himself you do have to wonder if in some way that uh, the constant breakdown of, of words poetically In people that uh, do that doesn't impact the way that they doesn't uh, change the way that they begin to interact with, with other people in other ways so that's that's uh, one one set of ideas now another comment was made by um Jose Lamsfus I hope I, I'm saying that properly uh, Josie Lamsfus or Jose Lamsfus and they mentioned that there may be a, a possible connection between um, Hieronymus Bosch and uh, the Garden of Eden and some of the evolution of the Pink Floyd albums and I'm not overly familiar with Hieronymus Bosch I, I did watch a video to try and understand kind of what um, Mr. Les was uh, his what his comment was was relaying and I suppose it's it's definitely possible I I tend to connect um Mr. Hieronymus Bosch's work with with the feel of an album like Dark Side of the Moon I, I would think that in, in particular that that one line of Dark Side of the Moon um, about everything being in tune but the Sun is eclipsed by the moon that kind of idea that the world is out of tune and that things are not lining up properly or the way that they should be definitely does feel like does feel like 
uh, some of the interpretations of uh, Heaven and Hell of Hieronymus Bosch's work. And that's pretty much it. I, I, I think that captures a lot of the ideas and questions and comments that people have been making. And I'm sorry if I can't break those down any more than I have. But ultimately, I think people can recognize that there are connections in thought and subject matter to a lot of Mr. Barrett's work and a lot of Pink Floyd's work and other uh, works of art, of course, which is part of the reason why so many people have called their music art rock. So uh, another thing that I'd like to kind of call out is that, again, now I'm writing and doing other things as I'm talking. So there's odd noises, like sometimes I'll click the pen or I'll rock around in, in the chair and it makes noises, and I'm sorry for that. And uh, that's just how it's going to be. I mean, I, I want to do things organically, as I've said before. So uh, Now, let's go ahead then, I guess, and, and we'll, we'll start off the episode. And what I'd like to discuss specifically in this, in this episode is the idea of the color red. And the, the reason for that is because it seems to be a color that Mr. Barrett is either very fond of or quite perplexed by in some way, or perhaps is trying to make a comment about. Now, <clears throat> previously we've made the connection to uh, Christianity with the color red, a possible connection with Christianity and the color red. I want to examine that some more, and uh, uh, in full disclosure, I do consider myself to be a Christian, and I... Uh, I'm, I'm not affiliated with any form of organized dogma, and I refuse to be because I I personally don't think that it fits or suits my own belief set. So um, I am what I would consider to be an independent form of a Christian. Okay, that's just disclosure uh, up front. So if I give uh, opinions that are leading in one direction, then um, hopefully. I, I'm trying to be objective about it and just discuss his work and not let my personal experiences and my personal opinions overly affect, but I will try to interpret things, which is, of course, a little bit dangerous because when you interpret someone else's work, you run the risk of totally misinterpreting it and uh, misleading people on what may be relayed, which I'm very hesitant to... Um, which makes me hesitant to want to do this. And it's part of the reason why this has taken so long is because I keep thinking about how I want to present this in a way that's fair to Mr. Barrett and fair to his work. Okay, so we have on numerous occasions, uh, Jug Band Blues mentions uh, being brought dressed in red. And we've discussed that to some degree in the Jug Band Blues episode. And there also is the line about a Scarlet Eagle, which I believe is from Matilda Mother. And uh, the Scarlet Eagle, like, rain, raining so sh silver on the people or something like that. Now, we, we've previously discussed the symbolism of the eagle and related it to royalty or nobility. So the red noble, I'll, <clears throat> I'll also point out here, that an eagle, of course, is a soaring bird, and in the sky it can look like a cross, as many birds can. So uh, that could also be a Christian reference or a cross reference there. And finally, the band name Pink Floyd. Pink, of course, is a shade of red. So <clears throat> the reason I'm, I'm bringing up these points is, is because uh, there does seem to be a predisposition to that color, in aspects of Mr. Barrett's life, and it certainly does carry over to his, his to his art. Uh, quite a bit of his of his paintings are done in red, which doesn't surprise us. Um, uh, artists like Pablo Picasso, of course, had a rose period where they paint in in various uh, hues and shades of red, uh, and we'll discuss some other people who have done so as well. So. I guess let's just go ahead and get to it then. I'm going to be pointing to a number of paintings by Mr. Barrett or aspects of them. And again, I would like to apologize. I cannot totally show you the paintings because uh, um, the age isn't to the point yet where they're um, outside of copyright control. So I will just show aspects or portions of them. 
that specifically show what I want to discuss. Now these come from uh, Barrett by uh, Russell Beecher and Will Schutz. We've discussed this book before. As I have said before, it's, it's a wonderful book. If you are interested in Mr. Barrett and connecting these types of things, uh, you, in my opinion, you need to have this book. Okay, so on page 182, there are two uh, paintings that are shown there. Now, these paintings have both been lost, apparently, at some point in time, or were destroyed. And they show geometric patterns. And the one on the top, which I'll show a section of, looks very similar to, like, bathroom tile. And the reason I, I really enjoy this, this particular painting, is because of the depth of it. Um, this usually is, a, is is attained by layering paint. I don't know how he put these together, but I just want to point out that the shading of this color is is wonderful. The variations in uh, tone of the color really give it a sense of volume, and it does look like tiling. I, I don't know what else is going on there. I don't know if he's making some form of message with the shapes and whatnot, but... I just want to point out that uh, the the control with color that he has and is displayed specifically in that painting. Now, on page 187, there is a self-portrait of Mr. Barrett, and his face is in a block of red. Uh, his face is red, and it appears that waves and other things are kind of crashing onto, uh, I don't know, some kind of... Uh, might be a, a a flood over land of red and in the bottom left is what appears to be like a house or something uh, the sun appears to be a bright red sun and to the upper right toward just to the right of the block is some squiggling and some what looks like lettering i can't really make it out uh, now, Mr. Barrett does this quite often. He makes doodles in the background that uh, could appear to be things or could be relaying some forms of messages, but they're very difficult to make out. Perhaps if I was able to see the full-size painting, I would be able to see it better. But it does, and it does kind of look like a winged figure is, is kind of leaving the ocean with his or her face upturned but um, again that's that's a very very sub, um, subjective kind of a, a realization to make so uh, we all have a tendency to see things in shapes that may or may not be there I will only point out of course that I know that Mr. Barrett here has represented himself as a block in some way with what appears to be waves hitting it and he is, his face is in that block of red. Now on page 189 is a uh, picture of what appears to be, I believe this is acrylic. It is acrylic on board and I will just show just the teapot and I want you to re realize that the shading of red is, it's beautiful. It looks ceramic in the painting, which I have rarely seen People really capture that kind of a uh, glistening and um, we compare it with the tabletop in the background it shines it really is wonderful that he's able to, to pull that off just with just with color now he's scratched through the paint to outline it and uh, and I don't know exactly why perhaps he's giving it shape without using the color like black as uh, Van Gogh would to separate figures which is an interesting way of doing that and it is of course effective and uh, we've seen him do that before with paint with uh, pictures by Mick Rock where he's gone and outlined things and scratched things out as well so we know he had a tendency to do that uh, the next one that I would kind of like to point out and I'm looking through these bit by bit is a painting of six crosses on page 199 uh, again untitled and this is uh, these are panels of lino print
print on paper. Now, essentially what this looks like to me is a well-formed cross in the upper left-hand corner. It's arranged in two rows of three, so one, two, three across the top, and then four, five, six on the bottom. I will just show you the first and the last um, panels. And the reason for this is because eventually, over time, uh, you have what appear to be red and perhaps purple squares surrounding the cross and a white cross with what appears to be blood on it. And it is morphing over time to eventually be a panel that is only this orange, red, and white. So two colors, really. So it's losing colors, but the cross also is losing its shape. It's losing its coherence. What that possibly could mean, I don't know. It could be a formulation of thought. It could be a representation of, uh, let's say, a, a unification of idea. Perhaps he's internalizing a form of Christianity. And in doing so, he's also changing it, which you would expect someone to do when they incorporate any system um, individually. They no longer adhere, to, perhaps, to orthodoxy and eventually develop their own form of morality where they tie it to their to themselves and in, in doing so they modify it and they modify themselves to meet at some point and completely internalize something. Perhaps that's what's going on, perhaps that's what's represented here in these um, in these in these series of representations. I, I don't totally know, but that's certainly one way of interpreting it. Now there are two last paintings that I want to discuss and um, I, I don't, I'm not really entirely certain how to kind of break this down. Now, uh, there is on page 220, now Mr., I've seen a, a kind of a discussion by Mr. Schutz, I believe it was, about this particular untitled painting, which is uh, Oil and Coffee on Canvas. And I'm sorry, I can't show you the entire thing, again, because it's uh, under copyright still, I believe. But <clears throat> Mr. Schutz, I believe, and I'll, I'll link his interview, he ties the coloration and general setup of this particular painting to a painting uh, by Gauguin entitled Vision After the Sermon, Jacob Wrestling with the Angel. Now, I just watched a documentary on Gauguin. It's pretty good. I'll try to link it if I can, if I can find it. And <clears throat> uh, Gauguin is a very, um, let's say, kind of outlandish person, I suppose. And the some of the background information of Vision After the Sermon is something that I think may have intrigued Mr. Barrett. I, I'm not entirely certain. But I, I will point out that, in my opinion, another painting that looks very similar to this in some degree... Well, before we move on, this, this painting is signed by Mr. Barrett. And I'd just like to point out that the Barrett uh, ends with two T's, and this is in 1971. I assume that's what the 71 means. The Barrett is signed with two T's, and those two T's are larger than the rest of the Barrett, and uh, they appear to be in cross shapes. And I will again point out that the, uh, and not again, but I'll point out that the cover of the book has Mr. Barrett's signature. It ends with two T's, and I want you to notice that, this, that the last T, the second T, is in the form of a cross. This is deliberately made, and this is harder to do than simply just writing two cursive T's. So you have to think, or at least wonder, if he's doing that to draw attention to it. Or perhaps just as a note to himself of what the, that may represent. So let's consider then what what this painting may represent. And I'll point to a couple things first off. Now, one is that this painting may not be meant to be simply looked at in one direction. And there is kind of a precursor to this. Now, there are other artists who have done a, a similar thing, but I'll point to uh, Kipling, Stories and Poems Every Child Should Know. This is a copy of a book that I have, and I'll give you the information for it. 
And within it is a story called Just So Stories, or a collection of stories called Just So Stories. And I'm not sure which one of the stories this is. Um, but on page 62 of my version is a picture of the whole story of the jaguar and the hedgehog and the tortoise and the armadillo all in a heap. And it specifically says uh, it looks the same pretty much any way you turn it. So as you turn it, the, the piece of artwork is supposed to represent basically the same idea. Now, <clears throat> I'll point out, of course, that there's the armadillo. And that's uh, one of the creatures that is referenced in Julia Dream, which is an interesting connection there. And, of course, the tortoise or the terrapin. Not the same animal, but the same sound, and representing basically the same animal of uh, a tortoise and a terrapin. One, of course, being one that stays on dry land, and the other is more uh, waterborne. So, uh, <clears throat> one of the connections, of course, that Mr. Schutz makes is with um, Gauguin's vision after the sermon, Jacob wrestling an angel, and he discusses that. And... You can kind of see that if you look at it with the signature oriented at the bottom. But if you turn it to the long side down, so I'm turning it in a clockwise direction, I'll point out that it, it looks somewhat similar to Henry Matisse's Red Room. Now, we do have a reason possibly to think that this may be tied to the... Um, uh, red Room, and that is the lyrics for Jug Band Blues, which references a blue room. So, of course, uh, blue and red, as we previously mentioned, were kind of, um, they were kind of periods of time in Picasso's career. Uh, we'll discuss Picasso further in the future, but in particular, Henry Matisse's drawing or uh, painting of a red, a red room um, shows a layout, if you notice uh, at the bottom center of Mr. Barrett's painting now, are layouts of what appear to be uh, shapes that vaguely correspond to the table setting of the Red Room. Whether this was meant to be looked at in many directions or just one, I, I really don't know. But that is an interesting correlation. The last thing that I'll kind of point out is, of course, that the Red Room is a is a... Uh, home setting and there is a hostess of some sort and one of the things that you'll try to do is is say well where where is the hostess and notably she's missing and I'll just point out that may be the point of the drawing or the painting that the hostess is missing it is missing from the red room uh, now <clears throat> the the last uh, the last painting that I want to discuss by Mr. Barrett is a complex one and I guess I'll just kind of jump into it and this is not going to be easy to discuss so please be patient with me. Uh, page 197 shows Little Red Rooster. Now Little Red Rooster is a painting uh, by Mr. Barrett, which appears to be showing, now I'll note that I don't see his signature anywhere on this painting, and I guess it's oriented in a way that makes sense to most people. You can see some forms in there that appear to be deliberate. Again, uh, there are painters that, like Jackson Pollock, who are painting simply with colors, without structure. Uh, that are giving shapes or sensations of shapes and tying that together with color to deliver something of uh, a sensation or a feeling or to, get, to convey an emotion with color or perhaps to deliver something in that way. I don't know if that's what's happening here or if there are actually structures. We have previously mentioned in other paintings that Mr. Barrett has a tendency to kind of doodle in... in uh, shapes in in the paintings themselves so it's kind of hard to know really if something is purposefully there or if it's just us seeing something that may or may not be there so 
let's go ahead then and consider what this may be pointing to. Now, most people will see on the left-hand side a kind of a hooded or a, a cloaked figure that many associate with Mary. And then in the center, the very center of the painting is a small child, what appears to be a small child and perhaps a bassinet of some kind. I won't be able to show the entirety of this. I'll just give kind of sections of it. On the right side of the painting are various forms in green. On the bottom right appear to be plants and things. Um, on the far bottom right is a light green thing that uh, I don't know. It's, it's a very strange looking kind of a figure there in the bottom right. I don't know what that is. In the top right are um, shapes that uh, it looks to be almost like a, a kind of a claw on the, in the upper right hand corner. Or it could be heads. There are impressions that appear to be teeth and claws. Again, reminding me of the the boy and the lion. You can go back and look at the episode on that that we did with the lion painting that he did. And there appear to be heads or shapes that are kind of lingering over the two of them with teeth and claws and stuff like that. So <clears throat> most people, of course, associate the color red with uh, um, with Christ, obviously because of uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ, etc. And uh, there are numerous paintings of uh, Madonna and Child, and nearly all of them show uh, red. Uh, either the Madonna or the Child Christ is 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 uh, placed with red, or is shrouded in red, or clothed in red in some fashion. There are so many examples of this that I'm not going to go through and try and name them all. And perhaps that is what is being relayed here. Perhaps this is just another Madonna and Child in some way. I, I would like to point out the possibility that this could be something that may be more painful for Mr. Barrett uh, because of the absolute um, coloration of red and the almost lingering danger that seems on seems to be on the side. So two possibilities, of course, that this is another form of the boy and the lion. Perhaps he is comparing himself to this child that is that is born and feels the presence of danger and death of the world, um, which is innate to, to the natural state of affairs in the world. Another possibility, of course, uh, which I'll discuss here in a moment, is the possibility that this may be dealing with something more painful, which could possibly be something like a stillborn child. Now, <clears throat> Uh, many, many people go through that process, and there are a lot of fertility issues in the world now. I don't know, again, that this is what Mr. Barrett is relaying. I'm just saying that with the predominance of red and the central figure of the child, you have to wonder if there isn't something uh, else going on, perhaps a relation or something that uh, has had a problem, and perhaps there was a miscarriage. Now, uh, a lot of people go through that. It's a very painful thing, and... I don't know necessarily uh, that everyone would kind of read it in that way, but uh, I just want to point that out that it is a possibility and that of course that would be quite devastating to a number of people. Uh, I have had friends that have gone through everything from fertility treatments and everything else and still not been able to have children. and. Uh, my wife did miscarry once, although it was very early in her pregnancy, and it, uh, let's just say it wasn't too bad of an experience. So, uh, a lot of people suffer through this, and if this is something that was perhaps on Mr. Barrett's mind, then I do kind of uh, wonder, you know, what kind of impact that might have had on someone like him. So, uh, let's... I guess move on. That's kind of a that's kind of a hard one to talk about and think about because um, a lot of people very much want to be parents and very much want to have children, but the truth is not everyone can have them, and n not everyone is able to experience that aspect of life. And even though they may want to very very much, it may evade them. And in many ways, it's not fair. But I I don't know what fair means. I, I mean, there's many ways of defining a person's life. And there's many ways of 
deciding how to make the most of your time. And some people are lucky enough to be parents and lucky enough to have children. And um, some people don't want to have them. And of course, that's totally their choice, uh, it, you know, to each their own. Every, every person needs to be able to define what gives them meaning. But I will point out that I have known people that very much want to be parents and very much want to have a family and can't. And, uh, and it's a painful experience for, for them. So <clears throat> that's pretty much it for the, for the actual paintings. That's all I wanted to kind of discuss within the artwork itself. Now, I would like to discuss a couple songs and perhaps you'll see why here in a minute. Now, we previously mentioned Bob Dylan and the aspect of his writing where he relays very personal stories and ties them up within his songs. And uh, we've made some discussions about Mr. Barrett himself and how he may also be doing that. Of course, it's a very easy way to write. You don't really run out of material. You simply relay incidents of your life and you dress them up a bit. Uh, some people dress them up a lot and some people don't. Uh, someone who I guess you could say dresses them up quite a bit is Jim Morrison and um, he does similar things with a lot of his lyrics and uh, I would say Mr. Dylan is a little bit more forthright in a lot of his lyrics and it does appear that in many ways Mr. Barrett is trying to relay things uh, as well as honestly as as he can while still remaining uh, retaining some anonymity. So for songs, what I would like to discuss are two songs or one song on the Barrett album that morphs into another song. Now the Barrett album was released in November of 1970. I won't go into the artwork of the cover, uh, but it is a very beautiful cover in my estimation uh, with minimalist brush strokes and structure. He's able to accurately relay the, the uh, geometry of various insects, various flying bugs, wasps, bees, and others, and uh, give the sensation of luminescent color on the wings uh, very well. I'll just throw in one here, maybe one or two, and I would like you to point out, uh, I would like to point out for you that if you, if you notice the wings in particular, he's just giving very few highlights, but you have the sensation of a full wing, which is pretty impressive. So um, let's look at Waving My Arms in the Air, which morphs into a song called I Never Lied to You. Now, these I'm, I'm choosing these because these kind of carry on the same discussion, apparently, as Dark Globe, and I'll explain why here in a moment. Now, Waving My Arms in the Air uh, starts off with Waving the Arms in the Air, uh, and he says, Love, my love has no care, no care, pressing my feet to the ground. So let's let's just look at the first part there. Now this isn't structured in any particular way, uh, other than rhythmically, and it seems rhythmically to be very simple. Now waving arms in the air could be a reference again to swinging twigs, coffee brands all around, which we discussed in um, in Dark Globe. Uh, mentioning that love has no care, no care. So there's a double on no care, which is re-emphasizing that same idea. There's an aspect of love and waving a person's arm in the air, which appears to give the idea of a, of a disagreement or an argument, or perhaps throwing their arms up in the air in exasperation and not caring about their love. Pressing feet to the ground there uh, could very much mean that uh, they're stomping and then the next line is stand up right where you stand. So standing and standing up, standing up to something, perhaps again, another reference to an argument. A mention of a call and what do you do? Lay back in a chair or relax, take it easy. The implication is that of course there's an argument and the person just kind of lays back and doesn't really seem to take it. Um, perhaps as seriously as he is, I don't know. I mentioned that she's high in the air or she's above it all. Half and half, I don't totally get half and half. And then I mentioned that all you have to do is call. Perhaps half and half is a reference to give and take or an ability to come to some form of agreement, which is saying that all you have to do is call. And uh, then hold her hand, stand a while, and then they smile at each other and they just seem to kind of understand, which is a natural thing in most relationships that people eventually seem to come to a kind of a 
even though quite a bit of talking takes place, quite often the uh, the relationship it reaches a point where you can just kind of look at each other and understand one another, which is a, a pretty uh, cool thing, I suppose. So, uh, yes, we do. Oh, what a girl I've got too. Now, when I first heard this song, I I didn't look at the lyrics, and I thought he was saying two as in the number two. But <clears throat> two here is defined lyrically as also. And, of course, I suppose that fits the context better because there's no other mention of another girl. So it makes sense that he's saying, oh, what a girl I've got two. And he's rhyming with do, and perhaps in a way he's making fun of the two. I don't know. I mentioned a slinky look. There's no one in the land. Uh, no one around, perhaps. And then it rains a lot Saturday, and it's a stormy day. Hey, hey. And then I mention again of you shouldn't try to be what you can't be. And we've heard this before. Don't try to be what you can't be. And that uh, was was in the um, the song. Jeez. Uh, I'm going to put the title of the song here. It's one of the first uh, songs that, that... It's the second song off of the Madcap Laughs album. I can remember that, but I, I can't really remember the... Oh, it's No Good Trying. So, to so hold your hands where I can't see, because I understand that you're not like me, etc. So, the idea that a person, again, is trying to be something, he's directing this to someone else, someone that should not try to be what they can't be. And the implication is, of course, that he is not trying to be what he can't be. What is meant by that is open to interpretation, of course. Um, you could say that perhaps he's saying that he can't be loyal so he's being he's being honest and that he can't be loyal or something uh perhaps he's being honest in saying that she perhaps is is with someone and shouldn't be trying to be with him i don't know but you can take from that what you will now that song morphs into the second song i never lied to you i'll give links for these with lyrics hopefully i can find if uh, anything else, you can just kind of look on your phone and follow along with the lyrics as we read them. Now, it starts off with a reference to what appears to be a gathering in a hall. And uh, the, he's saying that he won't know that someone's here at all. And the implication is, of course, that uh, this someone is an interest in some way. There's a lot of whining and, and drinking. And, of course, he has a song called Whining and Dining or something like that. Wined and Dined, I think. Nobody very hard. What that means, I don't exactly know what he means by hard, but it rhymes with yard. So again, he's twisting the meaning of his song to fit a rhyme. Lots of things to do. And the next verse, so these aren't structured normally. It's just kind of odd verses and kind of run on ideas. But he states specifically that all and more will be for you. So he's putting all of these things together and trying to be successful and make a show for someone else's benefit. It's explicitly stated there that everything is done for this person and that they tried to do everything they could with a certain person, but it was never easy. So the person, so the author in this case, Barrett, went around the world to, and then saw things you do and then arrived at their side. Why would they be, so here's a couple questions, okay? The first is, of course, that uh, this reference to going their way about the world is, of course, called out in the song Birdie Hoppin', which we have specifically discussed before. The idea that a person is going to travel around or go around the world and try to find their place or show who they are or perhaps prove who they are and prove their worth to someone in the sandbox of life. There's that reference, and it is here again. Now, saying that they saw the things that a person does, they arrive by their side, so, and that person is looking to, or looking also. So, what are they looking also for? A relationship, perhaps, with one another? Uh, perhaps looking for relationships with other people? Perhaps they're both looking for their way in the world in some way? Or a way to move on from adolescence into adulthood and adult relationships and solidified relationships. I don't know. 
you'll have to take that uh, as you will. But the important part there is arriving by your side. So why would someone need to arrive by their side? And, and I'll point out again, our breakdown in the episode on apples and oranges, where it appears that um, with the interview that Mr. Barrett is deliberately doing things to make a show, perhaps to impress someone, including uh, blinking and looking straight into the camera for effect and perhaps signaling someone that may or may not be watching in some way to deliver a message. I don't know. But why would he need to arrive by their side? That implies, of course, that um, in my mind, there's two possibilities. One is that they needed him, so he came to be with them by their side. Why would they need to be with him? Well, perhaps something went wrong. Perhaps something's going on. And I'll point you back to the painting of the red rooster as a possibility. The other thing that's, of course, possible is that uh, this person is per perhaps not being loyal to him and is looking for someone else. And so he got wind of that somehow or he knew what was going on. So he needed to go back and arrive by their side. And of course, if this is referencing the American tour, it would explain why he wanted to get back right away. Now, the, the last bit of the song is, is a bit of, uh, I'll just say it's a pretty sad bit. He says, uh, it's been like you're gone for one day, it's so long. And it's hard to bear things without that person there. And then he, th and then he thinks of them and the things they do when they're, when they're together and to be alone together. And then asking the question, why am I here and what's meant to be? Now, that why am I here and what's meant to be is, of course, what a lot of people go through when they are finding that a relationship is failing and they define themselves by that relationship. So then why am I here? What is supposed to be happening? Um, these are, of course, the thoughts and emotions that a person goes through very often when they are on the receiving end of a broken relationship. And generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, there is a person who seeks to end a relationship and a person who is, to some degree, surprised by the fact or a person that does not want to end the relationship in some way. So perhaps Mr. Barrett was on the on the losing end, I guess you could say. Uh, I, I shouldn't say losing end because I don't really believe that there are necessarily winners and losers in that way. What I mean is... He was on the receiving end of a kind of a broken relationship, which can be very painful and difficult to recover from for a lot of people. Some people, it's not a big deal, but for a lot of people, it's very difficult to recover from. So perhaps that's what he's referring to here. That certainly is one way to read the, the statement of what is meant to be and why am I here? What's going on? Who is he supposed to be? What is he supposed to be doing? What is the world really uh, defined by? And all of those types of questions are, of course, questions that people ask when they're on the receiving end of a broken relationship. So uh, that's pretty much it for the, those songs. Now, I would like to point out, of course, that I did, I did uh, title this The King of Paint. And the reason for that is because I want to look very specifically at a song by the police that was at least lyrically supposedly written by Sting and it's called King of Pain and let's go ahead and take a look at the lyrics and then I'm gonna score it and let's see if we can find any correlations the first is of course King and Pain I'm going to give two points right there because of the reference to royalty and the reference to suffering the very first line is incredibly alliterative uh, there's a little black spot on the Sun today so a lot of L's and a lot of T's and a lot of D's. So little black spot. And of course there's the B and the P sound together, black spot, which is alliterative. Of course, if you're making alliteration with the, the sounds of the mouth that we have discussed previously. So uh, I'm going to give that two points again. So we're at four. Now, I also want to point out, of course, the little black spot on the sun I've heard a variation of already, and so have you. Saw a crater on the sun is a lyric 
from Cirrus Minor. It's incredibly similar to this idea. Uh, now, of course, uh, you have artists like Chris Cornell who write songs like Black Hole Sun. And um, the idea or the imagery and the symbolism of the sun with a flaw in it can be uh, extremely common and many people make that relation. But this is similar enough, I think, to Crater in the Sun that I'm going to go ahead and give a point. So we're at five points. Same old thing as yesterday. Now, uh, I, I don't, I don't really want to get into that one too much. Um, that form of malaise, and um, that this is going to be referred to in later Barrett songs as well. The next line is about a black hat that's caught in a treetop. Again, there's another alliter alliterative with the T, so hat caught treetop. So I'll give that another point. Of course, uh, as I said, alliteration is, is very common in poetry. So a flagpole rag and the wind won't stop. So there's the idea of a wind and a storm. <clears throat> the very next line is about the pouring rain. We have just discussed these ideas, these very same ideas in the, in the songs, Waving My Arms and I Never Lied to You, where he's referencing the rain, etc. <clears throat> so I'm going to give that another point. So we're at seven, and the world is uh, turning circles in his brain, uh, and he's hoping that you'll end this rain, so that's another point for the rain. And I'll point out again that this is not a direct statement. This is an indirect statement. It is, it is a reactive statement. I'm hoping that you will do something, not I'm going to do something. This is a recessive statement. It is giving the action to another person. I'm guessing, I'm hoping that you are going to do something to end the rain, and it's my destiny to be the king of pain. So I'm not going to give another point for the king of pain, but I'll just ask you the question, what kind of king waits for someone else to take an action? If you are a king, you are, of course, in a position of authority. You are the one capable of taking action. That is an inversion of roles. And I will give another point for that. <clears throat> okay. Um, now the song tends to repeat a bit, but a little black spot on the sun today, of course, again, uh, there's a black hat, which I thought was a black cat when I first heard the song, but now I guess it's a black hat. Why there'd be a black hat, I, I don't know. Uh, perhaps that's just thrown in there because it's funny, like it sounds like black cat, black hat, when you put them together. I don't know. A flagpole rag. Man, that's an interesting word combination, isn't it? A flagpole rag. That's a very interesting word combination. Because flag and rag, and then the F and the L and the P and the L. Man, that is... I'm going to give that another point. And hopefully you can see what I'm saying. The F and the P are alliterative with the sound again. We're doing the same thing. The L and the, L and the L and the G and the G. Flag, pole, rag. A three-word combination that is... Ex it's expressing an idea, of course, of a flag that's been torn by the wind. But it's also three words. So, I mean... Sting wrote this. Uh, that that's pretty. That's pretty cool combination of words. <clears throat> um, you go through the chorus again. Let's get to the next verse. A fossil trapped in a high cliff wall. Eh. Again, fossil trapped. Cliff. Uh, cliff wall. There's more F and P's there, and L's. So that alliterative. That alliterative. Uh, Form continues. Dead salmon, frozen waterfall. Eh. Blue whale. There's a mention of color there, right? I'm I'm not gonna touch that one. I'm gonna say a blue whale is a type of whale, so spring times ebb. And a butterfly that's trapped in a spider web. And a butterfly, of course, is very common with Mr. Barrett, so I'm gonna give that another point. Uh, that's been repeated num uh, on numerous occasions. 
Of course, a butterfly, anyone can use the idea of a butterfly. Uh, a king on a throne, eyes torn out. I'm, I'm looking at the next verse here. A blind man looking for a shadow of doubt. A rich man sleeping on a golden bed. Ooh, that's an interesting one. A, a condescending view of riches, which we have mentioned is a Barrett tendency, so I'll give a point right there. And a skeleton that's choking a crust of bread. Eh. I don't know about those. I, I'm going to just give the one point for the rich man sleeping on a golden bed. Now the last bit here, a red fox that's torn by a huntsman pack. Um, now in Grand Chester Meadows, of course, they mentioned the dog fox turned to ground. So uh, it's a very similar idea. Again, uh, a fox hunt. So I'm going to give another point there. And of course, uh, supposedly Barrett did not write a Grand Chester Meadows that is attributed to Mr. Roger Waters, I believe. But we'll mention that that is similar in format to that Pink Floyd idea, that Pink Floyd song. A, bl a, a black winged gull, broken back, so a broken bird, uh, a hoppy bird, right, alone, a broken bird. So I'll give another point for that. And that's pretty much it. The rest of it just repeats. So I'm at 14 points for King of Pain. That is a song that does seem to correlate with quite a few ideas and imagery that Mr. Barrett has used um, and Pink Floyd have used in the past. Now, a lot of these symbols and ideas are, of course, open to use by everyone. Anyone can refer to a butterfly. Anyone can refer to uh, a king and a pain and... and um, a spider web and the sun these are all very common symbols that uh, everyone would use the question is of course the combination of the symbols the orderliness of them how they're used and whether or not it makes sense specifically to the story of sting and whether or not it makes sense uh, to the story of someone else so the story of the song that I've seen in an interview or I've read is that mr. Uh, Sumner, Gordon Sumner, or Sting, who is one of my favorite artists, by the way, and I've seen him in concert. He's uh, He was great. He's it's probably one of the best concerts I've ever been to. So, <clears throat> he was going through a breakup with his then wife and uh, took, I believe, a trip after the breakup to Jamaica, and he kind of was looking at the sun one morning. He was with his lady. I'm not sure if that was his new lady yet or not, um, who he eventually married, and uh, he was the king of pain. He looked at that. He had the idea of the little black spot on the sun, and he felt this uh, pain, I guess, associated with the breakup, and he wrote the song. So let's let's consider a few things and see if that if if that uh, rationale kind of holds out. And I'll just ask a few questions here. First off, in a relationship, and most of us have been through relationships. There's a person, of course, who's taking an action in a breakup and a person who's receiving the action of the breakup. There are times, of course, where people mutually decide to break up. That does happen. But more often than not, someone is leaning a little bit more towards the breakup side and someone's leaning a little bit more to the, re the breakee, the receiver of the breakup. So the story is apparently that Mr. Mr. Sumner wanted to break up or was going to divorce his wife and he views himself as the king of pain that's a little bit confusing to me because when I have been the person to initiate a breakup it has made me not the king of pain I feel like the king of guilt <laughs> or regret in many way in many ways especially when that person doesn't want to break up so it's an odd choice of words in that in that sense and I will again point to the fact that or uh, point to the lyrics anyway that says that again this person is the king but they're waiting for someone else to end the reign why they're the king of pain now uh, perhaps there's an association between guilt uh, and accusation and and the sensation of pain I don't know but uh, perhaps he's hoping that whoever this person is will will uh, allow him to move on and will allow him to no longer feel the guilt and pain that's associated with the breakup and the previous relationship. I don't know. It's just an interesting, a bit of an odd combination of ideas, and I don't know if it totally fits the story in my opinion. 
so that's pretty much it that's it for king of paint if you haven't uh, subscribed yet I'll, I'll ask you to if, if you don't mind go ahead and give a like a share subscribe turn on your notifications so you get notified we'll do a did Sid on another uh, on another song uh, hopefully soon I don't know which one yet I haven't totally decided I I have an idea that's a pretty large one and it would take quite a bit of time so I don't know if I'm ready for that yet but uh, check in I guess from time to time hopefully you enjoyed this episode and, and got some things to think about and again these are just my opinions on these topics so uh, I don't totally know what's going on with a song like King of Pain I don't totally know um, what's going on with the song or uh, with a painting like Red Rooster and uh, I, I should point out of course the Red Rooster was covered by the Rolling Stones so there's another possible Rolling Stone connection right there and that's an old uh, I believe it's an old blues song from the US I don't know who initially put together Red Rooster but perhaps again now there's another reading of Red Rooster which is it could simply be uh, an indicator of him entering a new life as a singer which we didn't discuss but certainly is possible well, it certainly is possible with Red Rooster and the idea of birth or childhood or birth into a new line of work or a new life which was as a kind of a rock star I guess we didn't really discuss that possibility but uh, certainly that is a possibility so I guess that's pretty much it um, I'll talk to you folks later